from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the Library of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center, I welcome you to a lecture by Dr. Juana Goodenow Kenworthy entitled, When the U.S. Went to War with Canada, Competing Narratives of the 1812 War. Now, first of all, I want to remind you to be sure your cell phones are off and that if you should ask any questions at the end of the session, it constitutes permission for us to record those questions. And uh, I also want to thank the John W. Kluge family for their continued support of the Kluge Center and the wonderful fellowships that have brought so many scholars to us. Um, if you want to learn more about your pro our programs, just go to loc.gov slash Kluge, K-L-U-G-E. Um, Dr. Goodno Kenworthy received her PhD in English from the University of Bucharest in 2006. Her dissertation, which was on British colonialism in 19th century Canada, received the Best Doctoral Thesis in Canadian Studies Award as granted by the International Council for Canadian Studies. She is a lecturer in the American Studies Department of Miami, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and prior to this was an assistant professor in foreign languages and literatures at the Spiru Haret University in Bucharest. Dr. Goodno Kenworthy's research looks at Canada against the historical intersect of British and American interests. Her work has been published in a number of journals, including the Journal of European Studies, the American Review of Canadian Studies, the Early American Studies Journal, and the Central European Journal for Canadian Studies. She has contributed articles and chapters to edited volumes published in Romania, Poland, and Serbia, and her book, which she has been working on this year under her Kluge Fellowship, is currently under contract to the University of Toronto Press. Please help me welcome her today, Dr. Juana Goodno Kenworthy. Thank you all for being here. Um, and before I start, I want to say how grateful I am um, for having had the opportunity to be here at the Kluge Center, do research every day in this beautiful building. Uh, it's been a great experience. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you, Carolyn, for, and all the staff um, at the Kluge and uh, my interns. I see Becky in the audience. Thanks for uh, making this a very productive stay. Um, my talk today draws upon the book manuscript which I completed during my stay at the Kluge and which deals with the literary representations of, Can of the U.S. in colonial Canada. Uh, my focus is on the relationship between 19th century debates surrounding uh, republicanism and popular democracy um, and the literary image of the U.S. in colonial Canada. Uh, my argument is that because of the similarities between uh, particularly English Canada and the U.S., the emphasis on the political distinctions and the values that upheld the two forms of government the two communities embraced uh, are central to the shaping of almost essentialized national images um, about the U.S. in, in Canada. Um, right now, I will focus on the role of the War of 1812 in the articulation of a Canadian colonial uh, response to the American cultural nationalism uh, in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, first, I will give a short presentation of the war and of the role of the memory of uh, the War of 1812 in Canadian cultural nationalism. Then I will turn to uh, discussing how um, narrativizing the war in the fiction of a colonial um, Canadian writer, John Richardson, fits in the political context of the decade, uh, the 1830s, um, early 1840s. And I will contrast, I, I will conclude by contrasting uh, Richardson's fictional work 
and fictional use of the past and of North American geography uh, with that of his contemporary and model, the American writer James Fenimore Cooper. Um, short historical background. Um, in Canada and the US, the nation building uh, process happened at different times and responded to different needs. In the US, the military and poli uh, political struggles of 1776 galvanized the sense of nationalism early on so that American artists, journalists, cultural elites in general were virtually from the moment of political independence concerned with developing a native literature. American literary nationalism stemmed from the need to create a cultural break with England to parallel the political break um, of the revolution. Before Herman uh, Melville, before Whitman, before um, Moby Dick and Leaves of Grass, there was Fenimore Cooper who successfully integrated North American content in, into British templates. His uh, leather stocking saga uh, featured the uh, adventures of um, Scott and Nancy Bampu in the American West of the late uh, 18th century and adapted the model of Sir Walter Scott, um, the romantic historical fiction, to these uh, North American historical events, which he used to craft a usable past for the new nation. As I will show in my talk, the same um, 18th century past is used by um, Canadian uh, John Richardson to try to create a usable past for the Canadian colonies still within the empire. Um, Cooper effectively inaugurated this new genre frontier fiction which spawned multiple imitators um, and um, he cast North America as the cradle of the new American nation, um, the, the North American wilderness as the crucible of American character and the anti-colonial struggle with Britain as the defining moment of the nation's history. Yet continental history looked different from north of the Great Lakes. Um, Britain took over um, Quebec after the Treaty of Paris in 1763 and thus inherited the French-speaking Catholic colony in the New World alongside the rest of its American possessions. Um, the treaty guaranteed the French colonists um, their cultural and religious rights and the status was reinforced by the Quebec Act of 1774 which extended the boundaries of the colony in the, uh, into the Ohio Valley. You see on the map on the left, the boundaries of um, the province of Quebec in 1774, and extended French uh, law and uh, practice of Catholicism to that region. Incidentally, this is one of the grievances in the American uh, Declaration of Independence, the fact that French law had been introduced in those uh, territories. Um, which had been under, un, until then under English law. The British Empire was no evil oppressor in Canada, uh, but rather at the core of local allegiances. Between 1776 and 1783, 30,000 loyalists had left um, the um, American Republic and took their possessions, abandoned their homes, and trekked north in order to be in the territory still under the British crown. Um, this influx of loyalist Anglophones changed the demographics of Canada, uh, bringing a sizable uh, population that wanted to live under English law and uh, worship in their own way. So this led to uh, the division of the province of Quebec in 1791 into Upper and Lower Canada. And you see on the map, Lower Canada um, was French Canada, Upper Canada was roughly the equivalent of southern Ontario of today. <clears throat> Each had its own legislative assembly and government, and these two colonies were to continue separate until 1841 when they were united uh, into the province of um, Canada with one um, legislative assembly. Um, this is the period during which the novel that I'm going to focus on um, was written. It's kind of the, the years preceding the union of French and English Canada uh, and the decades after the War of 1812. In other words, oh, this is the, uh, the Dominion of Canada, um, which was created in 1867, and even then it only included the eastern part of what we know today as Canada, um, adding the maritime provinces of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and uh, Prince Edward Island to the province of Canada created in 1841. 
So at the time when, in the 1840s, American cultural nationalism was in full swing, and while American writers were struggling to create a native literature to match the political entity of the US, Canada was facing multiple challenges um, when it came to identifying a cohesive, consistent narrative about of its uh, national identity. There are three main challenges. First, the um, internal division between French and English in Canada, um, which led to two competing views of history. The French saw themselves as a conquered people um, and resisted integration into a narrative of um, national identity or colonial identity under the British rule. The second was precisely the supranational framework of allegiance provided by the British Empire, uh, which made it that most English Canadians even defined themselves as British rather than Canadians and thought about the transoceanic community of the empire as their extended home. And the third challenge was the threat of cultural and um, territorial imperialism from the US. Um, culturally, Canadian colonists read American um, periodicals, Canadian writers published in Canadian as well as in American periodicals. Um, they had close family contacts south of the border. Um, and the other source of uh, cultural influence came from American uh, settlers that moved north into the uh, crown lands and by taking simply an oath of allegiance to uh, the crown, they could get free land. So they brought with them their um, values, their mores, their political views, uh, preference for certain forms of organization, and like the War of 1812 will show, their loyalty to the Canadian colonies was viewed as tenuous in the case of an American military aggression. But most importantly, there was no sustained centralized movement to create a national literature. Um, although the 1840s do mark in Canada a in, uh, growing interest in the teaching of colonial history, in the creation of monuments, and in uh, celebrating the past, Canadian literature as a discipline only came into existence in the 1960s. However, as my research in um, early Canadian writing shows, there was a sense of Canadian distinctiveness prior to the Confederation of 1867. Um, although it did not build upon separation from the British Empire, but rather upon continuity with it. Early Canadian fiction tried to craft stories that would reconcile all these three dimensions of Canadian uh, realities and struggle to uh, craft a, a coherent story about the community, its past, and the future. In John Richardson's fiction, The War of 1812 implots the same history and geography that American authors were using south of the border, but with the goal of asserting Canadian loyalty um, to the British crown. Now a few words about the war. Oops. The war started as an extension of the Napoleonic Wars in, in um, North America, um, so the North American battlefield, so to speak, but also reflected unresolved tensions between uh, Britain and the US. There were three main problems that marred uh, Anglo-American relations after the revolution. First, uh, Britain provoked the US in 1807 by uh, banning neutral powers from um, trading with France, and this um, disturbed American trade and upset many people. Uh, second, there was the impressment controversy, which was actually um, at the center of the, or the main reason uh, for the war uh, as it was declared. So in order to refurnish its depleted army, the um, British government declared that over 2,000 uh, British um, subjects were serving in the American Merchant Marine. So the Navy routinely intercepted US ships in the high seas and impressed sailors on board on the grounds that they were British uh, subjects. Now, these were primarily Irish immigrants or British immigrants to the US that had been naturalized. But by, by, doing, by impressing them, by taking them, in a way the um, um, British government refused to acknowledge that a British subject could be turned into an American citizen through naturalization. Um, I'll get back to this and to the symbolism of the impressment the controversy later. The third concern um, centered around the creation of an Indian state. Um, between the Great Lakes and the Ohio River Valley. This was a project that was supported by the powerful um, fur lobby uh, in Montreal because they viewed an Indian state as providing a buffer against American competitors from encroaching on uh, their turf. And the British um, off promised support for the creation of this. Um, 
the alliance of Britain with Native Americans was to offer much fodder to American propaganda both before uh, and during the War of 1812. Now, the less acknowledged issue had simply to do with the desire to annex Canada. Um, by the early 1810s, resentment against Britain had in inspired a loud faction of Republicans in Congress to call for war. These politicians came primarily from the Western states, so um, restrictions on trade uh, or the impressment of um, American uh, sailors did not affect them directly. Um, but they, they called for war. Uh, they claimed it was going to be an easy, cheap, painless war that would expand the boundaries of the US. Uh, when President Madison um, signed the Declaration of War against Britain in 1812, the US war hawks, and there's a photograph of war hawk Henry Clay, who was Speaker of the House, and pushed for the war. And he was also one of the um, American dignitaries that um, negotiated the Treaty of Ghent that concluded the war. So they couched this war as, um, they hailed the conflict as a second uh, war of independence um, and presented it in the language of, of a war uh, to liberate Canada from the British imperial yoke. This is a photograph of the US Declaration of War. It's in the Library of Congress holdings. Um, now, much like the American Revolution before it, the War of 1812 was a civil war fought among essentially similar groups of people. Uh, divided by allegiance to different forms of government rather than by uh, language, religion, or ethnicity. The impressment that I mentioned earlier opened the not yet healed rift um, which the American Revolution had introduced in British national self-definitions because the conflict, as I said, pivoted on the contentious boundary between being a king's subject and the republic's citizen. Citizenship was chosen. It had been chosen in the revolution. It was chosen again um, by immigration, by individuals. Uh, whereas being a British subject was something that was established at birth. Um, and by um, denying that the Americans could convert a subject into a citizen through a process of naturalization, Britain was symbolically um, refusing to acknowledge the national sovereignty uh, gained by the War of Independence. But defending one's country in the war also tested uh, allegiances to um, a particular um, country and also the legal categories of citizen and, and subject. The tenuousness of the line dividing British subjects from American citizens in the war underpinned the rhetoric of the conflict and justified many of the strategies employed. For instance, a month after um, President Madison had declared war, the governor of Michigan, General William Holm, marched into Detroit. And because he didn't have enough men to take the uh, garrison um, across uh, the river, it, he thought it would be a good strategy just to invite the Canadian militia to desert and join the American troops. So he launched a proclamation. This is, um, again, in the holdings of the Library of Congress, the proclamation, General Hall. Um, encouraging them to uh, abandon their post and hoping that left without the Canadian militia and just with a handful of British regulars, uh, the Gar Amster Amsterburg uh, garrison would be easily taken. Now the proclamation was printed in English and French and encouraged neutrality, but also warned against those who resisted the invasion. Um, this is a paragraph from the um, proclamation, um, but I want to uh, draw your attention to the part that states that no white man found fighting by the side of an Indian will be taken prisoner. Instant destruction will be his lot. Now this proclamation hinted at the widely used practice of um, including Indian warriors in um, the British uh, troops. Uh, and American soldiers, as well as American settlers, were terrified of the natives. And this fear uh, was an important factor in the war. Um, this is a cartoon at the time um, criticizing the British use of savages um, or portrayed as um, barbaric and not respecting the civil conventions of uh, warfare. Um, as I will show later, there was an entirely different perception and construction of the British Native Alliance on the Canadian side. So basically, Hull's proclamation offered a promise of integration in the US if um, Canadian militiamen chose to become citizens and abandon their British um, uh, positions. 
but also represented a threat because British-led forces in Canada almost always included Indians, so that any militiaman doing his duty would have been um, risking execution if captured by Hull. Now, the threat of American invasion drew Canadians together, and even the French Canadians who were unhappy with the British um, occupation decided to throw their lot in with the, with the crown for fear that an American rule would take away their linguistic and religious rights, which the British rule had guaranteed. Um, the, the way the war was remembered after its conclusion emphasizes this cooperation. This is a, a, a painting of the time showing um, a battle of Canadian victory under a French-Canadian um, officer uh, when um, American forces were heading for uh, Montreal and the Canadian militia um, stopped them. Not only victories, but also defeats helped to forge a sense of Canadian solidarity in the war. In April, in April 1813, the Americans launched a, ri a raid uh, across Lake Ontario to York, present-day Toronto. Um, the provincial capital, complete with public buildings, a garrison, a weapons store, um, and as the British troops retreated, the American soldiers went on a looting spree and ransacked every unoccupied house and burned down the upper Canadian parliament to the ground. Another um, defeat, which is celebrated on the um, American side, um, but also remembered on the Canadian side is the Battle of Mor Moravian Town where US troops crushed the Canadian militias and killed the Shawnee leader Tecumseh. <coughs> this is <coughs> painting, um, um, presenting the death of the Indian leader. Now what happened in New York served as precedent for the other iconic episode in American national my mythology connected to the War of 1812. Because in August 1814, uh, the British, under um, Admiral Cockburn, marched directly on Washington and inflicted upon the city the same treatment the American troops had inflicted on York. The capital was burned to the ground, and the White House was burnt and ransacked. It said that President um, Madison had to flee the White House and left behind a fully prepared meal, which the British soldiers enjoyed before trashing the place. <laughs> and, this is a British cartoon presenting the fall of Washington, and I don't know if you can read the captions. Um, they're basically suggesting that Madison is fleeing and is going in the arms of his friend Napoleon. Um, this is another uh, set of illustrations that shows um, the burning um, capital, the burned capital, and the portrait of Admir Admiral Cockburn, and the background um, is the burning capital. The end of the Napoleonic War in Europe sealed the fate of the conflict in North America because more troops were free to be sent to Canada. So Britain and um, the US negotiated peace at Ghent two weeks before um, the famous American victory at New Orleans, where th there's uh, Andrew Jackson, um, the central figure um, in this uh, image. Um, so the the battle of New Orleans and the American victory of New Orleans was an unnecessary carnage because the American and British government had already uh, decided the, um, um, to reaffirm the status quo from before the war. So the Anglo-American was over in 1814. At least 15,000 combatants had been killed or wounded, and nothing had been changed. The three-year conflict amounted to little more than a series of stalemates on which both sides won and lost battles, celebrated heroes, and boasted their respective national identities. The most tragic story is that of the Indian nations involved in the conflict. Because the end uh, of the war brought little change to the white uh, power balance uh, in the region, at Ghent, uh, Great Britain betrayed again her allies and gave up support for the creation of the, nation, of the Indian state uh, when it became clear that uh, the United States was not going to accept it. The war was not a unanimous ideological success on either side. Um, in Canada, some of the more recent immigrants went back to the US, the immigrants that had moved from the US uh, north just for free land. Um, others felt ambivalent about fighting uh, the Americans, so they just refused to join the militias. On the American side, the Federalists were vo vocal opponents of the war. The New England um, states pro protested the war and even threatened with secession. Um, but in retrospect, the war managed to galvanize the public imagination in the decades after uh, its end and remolded in the long run the political and cultural fault lines of North America. Both countries emerged from the war thinking it had won. Uh, 
with fortified self-images of realms of liberty. And generations of historians um, on both sides claimed victory. The US promised its citizens an empire of individual liberty and democratic government, which of course um, drew the boundaries of citizenship around whiteness. Um, while north of the border, British North America defined itself as an empire of ordered liberty anchored in hierarchy and constitutional monarchy and ostensibly inclusive of multi-ethnic differences. The greatest legacy of the war in British North America had to do with its place in Canadian cultural nationalism. The war transformed the collective identity the same way as the American Revolution had done for the US. It made Canadians choose between monarchy and republic. It asked them to fend off invasion by a larger po uh, power. And it required many residents to balance their personal and local uh, loyalties with allegiance to um, the British uh, rule. Only this time, the supporters of empire won. The American Republicans lost so that Canadian nationalist historians were able to fold the war together with the earliest loyalist migration um, and effectively rewrote the story of defeat of 1776 into a tale of national redemption and unity. Today in the US, the war is more or less a forgotten conflict overshadowed by the symbolic prominence of the revolution and the civil war in national mythology. And although 2012 marks the 200th anniversary of the conflict, with the exception of states directly affected by the war, such as Maryland, there's little done on a federal level to commemorate the events, which is very different from the um, massive um, efforts to uh, celebrate uh, the anniversary of the war in Canada. Um, what's interesting is that in the US, the war is cast as a war with Britain which overshadows the Canadian, the, the, the Canadian involvement in the conflict, the role of uh, Canada in starting the, the conflict, um, and allows for this rereading and re-celebration of the war as a second war of independence. On the Canadian side, the war is remembered as a war with the US, uh, in which French Canadians, natives, um, English Canadians fought against a common uh, enemy. Now, um, in the 1830s and 1840s, when um, the novel I'm going to talk about in the uh, rest of my uh, talk uh, was written, um, the colonies were trying to um, figure out their future in, in North America. The 18, in 1837 and 1838, uh, there were two violent um, colonial rebellions that were, um, although they had more complex causes, they were largely perceived to be um, the result of uh, Republican influence on can Canadian Moors. Politically, the end of 1812 had repositioned Canada at the interface of two ideological realms uh, structured around two forms of government, American Republicanism and British constitutional monarchy. And as the 19th century was gradually morphing into an ideological contest between monarchy and republic, Canada became a testing ground for colonial policies meant to see if democracy and self-government were compatible with constitutional monarchy. Um, the existence of a loyal and uh, monarchical Canada right next to a democratic Republican US would have legitimized and validated the organizing principles of the British Empire at the time when um, the American model was becoming uh, more and more um, uh, powerful and uh, uh, American political life were becoming more populist starting with Andrew Jackson's presidency. The can Canadian political culture held republicanism and popular democracy in mistrust. And this was not a mid-19th century phenomenon, nor was it uniquely Canadian, because starting with the American Revolution, and even more so after the French Revolution, European politicians, philosophers, and artists alike had voiced their uh, skepticism toward the future of republics and expressed doubts about the desirability or possibility of absolute equality and the rule of the people. Um, in, in Canada, the society was not an exact replica of the mother country. It was more democratic. Um, but the choice between monarchy and republic, the, any debates, colonial debates surrounding the introduction of, of more democratic elements in, in the government of the province, always kept in mind uh, a larger choice that the colonists fe felt they had to, uh, to make between being British and being Americans. There's always a constant association between national identity and, and um, support for a particular form of government over the other in uh, the early Canadian text I've examined. 
So colonial authors reflected on Britishness, imperialism, and the incompatibility between American and co uh, Canadian cultures. Um, and their writings can be best understood by situating them in this ideological context which projected the uh, British North American colonies to the forefront of more general speculations about the future of the monarchy as a political institution and its chances of survival in a democra democratic world. Um, Major, Major John Richardson was born in 1796 in Queenstown on the Canadian side of the Niagara River. He was the grandson of a prominent loyalist who owned uh, large tracts of land in the Niagara region and was part Ottawa through his maternal grandmother, although he cultivated his public persona as a white British Protestant male. Um, but his writings show great sensitivity to issues of race. His um, portrayal of Native Americans is very nuanced and um, one can explain this through his awareness of uh, his heritage, as well as through um, a very intimate experience with natives in, in the house of his, um, of his grandfather. Um, he personally met Tecumseh. He fought alongside him in the War of 1812. Um, and he was only 15 when he joined the Canadian militia, um, was captured by the American troops, was a war prisoner in Kentucky for a year. And then he spent the rest of his life after his release as a on half pay uh, officer in various points of the empire. In 1838, at the end of the colonial rebellion, as I mentioned, he was sent to Canada as a correspondent for the London Times. And, but he only remained in the country eight years. While here, he tried his hand at politics, journalism, started a literary magazine, wrote a history of the War of 1812, and petitioned the government to have it used in schools because he was appalled to find out that Canadian um, school children learned history on American textbooks, <laughs> who he agreed, <laughs> said, um, told an entirely different story about the war <laughs> and who the bad guys were. Um, and in 1840, he published The Canadian Brothers. Now, his efforts to start a literary um, nationalist movement in Canada failed. Uh, he couldn't uh, make a living uh, from his uh, literary magazine. And in 1849, ironically, he moved to New York, <laughs> where he wrote Pulp Fiction for the rest of his life. <laughs> Together with its prequel, published in 1832 in, in London, Wakusta, the Canadian Brothers is now part of the national literary canon and, and, um, because it, it, it tells the story of the foundation of, of Canada within the framework of empire. Um, like I said, Richardson modeled his work on Sir uh, Walter Scott's fiction, but also on Fanny Moore Cooper's um, frontier romances. Um, his goal was to offer an alternative to um, American interpretation of North American um, history and, and geography, and thus try to reconcile the colonial and um, local dimensions of belonging in, in Canada by offering his readers a national past, an invented national past in which natives, French Canadians and English Canadians were all in participants, equal participants, into a British struggle for freedom against the Republican chaos to the south. Now the story of the Canadian brothers focuses on, two Canadian brothers, <laughs> on the background of the War of 1812. Um, during a routine operation, one of the brothers, Gerald, captures an American ship. Aboard, he meets the beautiful and mysterious American Matilda Montgomery, falls in love with her, and is ready to sacrifice his career and duty to be close to her. His brother, Henry, watches uh, Gerald's growing infatuation uh, and um, Gerald's gradual descent into depression and alcoholism as he struggles with his love for the American woman. Throughout the novel, Gerald is the loyal brother who tries to pull his brother back to um, his duty in the war. Um, and as the story unfolds, we're informed that um, Matilda is the daughter of an American spy living in, in uh, Canada. Um, in the pursuit of his romantic obsession with Matilda, Gerald is also involved in the historical events of the war, which enables Richardson to include them in his story. Um, and, uh, but in the end, he returns to his garrison. Um, although consumed by guilt, he um, is not, the, the return to, the, to his duty is not a happy ending, and he dies on the battlefield at Queenstown Heights, accidentally killed by his own brother who mistakes him for an American. <laughs> the brother is also killed by Matilda's American father. <laughs> Everybody dies. 
As a hybrid between a frontier tale and a historical novel, the Canadian Brothers is in many ways an imitation of Cooper's frontier novels, uh, which were so popular um, during the 19th century and um, even later. Now, I argue that Richardson's uses of the land, of the frontier, and of the um, past in his fiction depart from Cooper's model in ways which illuminate the particular take, Canadian take, on North American history. First, first Cooper's leather-stocking tales locate the origin of American character in a struggle between wilderness and civilization. Uh, Natty's adventures in the North American forests of the 18th century are constantly juxtaposed to references to the settled geography of the American Republic in the 1820s uh, and 1830s, and references to the co continent's colonial past exist, but are marginal to the over overall thrust of the uh, series and posited as irrelevant to the course of development of the uh, young republic. Uh, by contrast, Richard's Canadian community emerges as a result of war and as a result of a choice of political allegiances and commitment to a form of government. In other words, the frontier, which in Cooper's fiction separates wilderness from civilization, is, in Richardson's fiction, an ideological borderland dividing the American Republic from British monarchy. Second, Cooper's hero, Natty Bamboo, flee settlement. His journeys into the wilderness offer him an open path for individual self-exploration and discovery. He rejects the frontier, reject the, uh, uh, he re sorry, embraces the frontier and rejects the rules that settlement brings about. And as such, he's coded as the true American, the one, the one that um, had really imbued the uh, spirit of the new land, is individualistic, self-reliant, frontiersman who rejects the conventions associated uh, with the old world and in uh, the context of um, Cooper's novels with the East Coast. To Richardson, by contrast, it's the community rather than the wilderness that offers safety and protection. And the novel's narrativization of the War of 1812 frames the conflict as a clash between Canadian communitarianism and loyalty to the crown and American individualism and republicanism. Matilda is a temptress, but the temptation she represents also um, is the temptation of individual desire and over the duty over toward the community. Significantly following one's impulses and desires is not liberating. As I said, Gerald is depressed, is consumed by guilt, uh, succumbs into alcohol alcoholism, and his brother's efforts to get him back to the garrison dramatize the pull of the community as the safeguard against the destructive effects of personal desires and impulses. Conversely, the North American frontier is coded differently by the two authors. Um, the Canadian characters flee into the wild when they abandon their duty, but the forest is not presented as a place of freedom, but as a place of chaos and anarchy. Um, the law or respect for um, the law are also used as markers of nationality. Um, the law abiding Canadians versus the lawless um, Americans. The most um, powerful scene of the, reject the American characters in the novel as rejecting conventions of all sorts are in uh, the scene where Matilda's father hides, the, the, the spy hides in the Canadian woods and commits cannibalism, but in a re ultimate reversal of Gothic convention, he eats Indian flesh. So when he is caught by two American officers, he says, I do not eat American subjects. The American law has no um, <laughs> right to um, do anything to me. The third difference between Cooper and Richardson is their use of the natives in fiction. Richardson uses the war to craft a national epic that includes the natives rather than exclude them. Cooper's frontier is the place where the Indian tribes vanish in the wilderness, dying away as the young republic takes over. Um, to Will Richardson, the wilderness is never presented as about to be domesticated, nor are the natives picturesque appendages of the wild. There are no certainties about the success of European settlement. Reflecting historical realities, um, the natives are vigorous partners and allies in war, and what unites them to the British and Canadian um, characters in the novel is their loyalty to the crown. Rather than isolated psychics to white characters like uh, Nati's uh, uh, Indian um, friends in Cooper's novels, Richardson's characters are included um, in a Canadian community forged in conflict. For instance, Tecumseh occupies a central role in the plot of the novel. He and the two Canadian brothers, uh, Gerald and uh, Henry, fight side by side against Americans. 
and he's a valued military uh, leader whose suggestions are followed by, American, uh, by British officers. He's described in, in terms which challenge stereotypical portrayals of the natives in frontier fiction. The language Richardson uses in describing him and the motives that uh, behind his decision to make an alliance with the Brit British uh, is a language of um, European conventions of warfare. Um, the Indians are patriots fighting for their country against American aggression and abuse. And um, by doing so, so, Richardson rhetorically cancels out the common accusations on the American side that the Brit uh, Britain was using savages in the war. In, in this, uh, in, throughout the novel, what we have is a presentation of military alliances strategically made because of uh, the love for country rather than using the natives as tools uh, in, in war. This is a watercolor published at the turn of the century that captures this um, sense of uh, native um, British relations in the, Cana in the 1812 war. You see the British Isaac, uh, General Isaac Brock, who is also a hero of the war uh, in Canadian imaginary, and Tecumseh shaking hands um, as equals, equal partners in, in uh, a military conflict. Conclusions. So the War of 1812 serves as the background against John Richardson crafts a story of Canadian loyalty which has potential relevance for the choices Canada had to make in the 1840s um, as the two provinces were united and were pushing for self-government. The choice was whether to pursue a um, form of government that would bring them closer to the American model and possibly uh, incorporated into the US, or to find a balance, to find a middle way that would reconcile membership in the empire with more representation on the con colonial um, level. First, the conflict functions as a usable past that legitimizes the continuity of the British Im imperial rule in North America, and the same war which is hailed south of the border as a second war of independence, becomes, under Richardson's pen, the ultimate test of Canadian allegiances to constitutional monarchy and to the emotional bonds of empire. Rather than granting symbolism to the frontier as cradle of a future nation, Richardson frames a North American um, wilderness an, as a fr an ideological frontier. The choice is emotional as much as rational, allegiance to the crown, but also commitment to the best form of government. Uh, and the result of this choice will be a continuum which recasts colonial history from early settlement into self-rule in the 1840s and Commonwealth later on, but in which empire remains the center element of Canadian self-definitions. Second, the novel uses the war as a crucible in which natives, American loyalists, English Canadians, and French Canadians have the opportunity to forego their differences and discover their shared values uh, by fighting against the common enemies. And this narrative of the war proved particularly resilient in as much as it um, served later 20th century uh, policies of multiculturalism and their importance for Canadian self-definitions to this day. And third, to Richardson, historical fiction is the vehicle of a national fantasy, not only of uh, indigeneity, but also of a Britishness predicated on cultural affinities which are essentialized as national characteristics. Canadianness becomes dependent on reject the rejection of the American form of government, but also on support on a set of values incompatible or described as incompatible with American <coughs> ideology. The very conceptual categories which Richardson uses to define his um, characters and structure his plots reflect his constant negotiation between the two national meta-narratives competing in a North American world to the lawlessness of the American Republic or the perceived lawlessness of the American Republic, the British North American space articulates a local identity rooted in tradition, lawfulness, and conservatives as markers of a civility in which all Canadians could share. American narratives of liberty predicated on individual will and individual rule are coded as anarchic and dangerous. Republicanism and popular democracy become symbols for organized selfishness in early Canadian fiction, and the community emerges as the only protector against one's own instinct. In The Canadian Brothers, the community is multifaceted, and it um, evolves from 
the family, which in the plot of the novel is represented by the pool of fraternal love, the brother that tries to get Graham back to his um, duty, to the nation, as in, um, uh, to the garrison, sorry, represented by um, Grantham uh, fellows, uh, fellow officers, particularly uh, General Brock, who appears in, in the novel, to the nation, or the, the colony, as in Canada, and to the larger transoceanic <coughs> community of the British Empire. Going back to the community, rather than following <coughs> one's individual impulses, is the final choice of the protagonist because imperial law is, in Richardson's narrative of the War of 1812, the defining form of freedom that shapes Canada. Thank you. I can start with the second question because the, war, the First World War represents the kind of end point of what is called Canadian imperialism. Um, Canadian imperialism um, started in the second half of the 19th century and it, it doesn't represent, it, it doesn't mean the same thing as imperialism as we understand it today. It meant commitment to the idea of, to the community of Greater Britain. There were talks about creating an imperial federation, bringing the colonies um, more represent, uh, representation uh, for the colonies uh, in, in London. Um, but th the sense of belonging to Greater Britain was very powerful in the second half of the uh, 19th century uh, and into the turn of the um, tw uh, 20th century. But World War I marks the end of that. Point. Uh, this is when allegiance to this idea, abstract idea of the British Empire starts to falter. Um, there, I would say perhaps because there's less perception of the U.S. as, a, as an kind of an enemy from which um, Canada needed protection, but also because the war asked Canadians to fight <laughs> and test that uh, um, their allegiance in a war that could not be ideologically uh, in any way supporting a sense of Canadianness, um, but the war marks the end of allegiance, the, the kind of powerful allegiance to empire that characterized the second half of the 19th century. As to the first part of, the, uh, of your question to the um, conceptual use of nation, um, I, what I, this is something that I'm struggling with in, in the sense that for early Canada, the nation state was not something that was pursued in any way. Uh, there was a sense of a colonial community and allegiance to the colony, but as that colony was part of the, of the imperial framework. Can early Canadian uh, definitions of, I, or self-definitions as I, I um, discover them in my research, in a way bypass the model of the nation state. 
they, they show the possibility of kind of articulating belonging in terms that are not predicated on separation from empire, on a clearly dis, dis, delimited nation state. So, um, and th this existed in parallel with, you know, the, the, what became the dominant model for the new world, like the, the American model, the republic, separation from empire, uh, nationalism. Um, it's interesting, in Imagine Communities, Benedict Anderson just dismisses Canada in two lines, like, well, that was the exception of the rule. <laughs> but I, I find it fascinating that there is an enduring uh, strategy of articulating identity that does not need the nation state. Um, what I, the term that I also use is cultural patriotism more than nationalism because I try to capture this sense of allegiance to the community that is more flexible and allows for allegiance to the empire at the same time. Canad early Canadians did not see any contradiction between defining themselves as British and Canadians at the same time. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, could you, uh, would you venture to comment on how Well, my first experience with how I have no, I have not studied how it's taught, but I <laughs> know it anecdotally because the first time I went to Canada for research, I was talking to a student and said, "Yes, the War of 1812 is when we fought the Americans and we beat them." My American students don't really know much about the War of 1812. Um, I would say that the way it's remembered, <laughs> based on what I see uh, around me, is is more like a series of vignettes. I mean, in the U.S., vignettes that kind of complement the nation building process uh, inaugurated by the American Revolution. So there's the Star Spangled Banner, and there's the Battle of New Orleans, there's a, a kind of a, a, a rea reaffirmation of British, uh, of American separation from Britain. But I couldn't tell you how it's taught in school, so if anybody has a better <laughs> sense of how it's taught, that would be good to hear. Yeah. No, that would be fascinating, yes. I wonder if they read this book that you just described. <laughs> yeah. Or how they might have reacted to some things or to some of the policies you, you mentioned about public declaration. Yeah, I know. I, I have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I don't know, I haven't come across any, any documents. I don't even know if there were any written, there would be any written documents capturing. Um, well, this is not something that I'm concerned with, but it is, um, there's a great book by Andrew Caton called The Dominion of War, and um, part of it deals with the legacy of French settlement in the New World in terms of native um, European relations. So the French, ar his argument is that the, um, the Second British Empire inherited many of the practices of French Canada uh, more, tol more integration of natives in the fabric of society. I mean, French Canadians intermarried with natives, the coureurs du bois, the, the early um, fur traders um, established oops, communities. Um, there, there was less of a racial divide um, and more integration uh, than in the what became the 13 colonies, where um, I think that the model that he uses was the Dutch 
uh, template of separation of the white settlements from the natives as opposed to trying to um, um, cooperate with them. There's also a difference in patterns of settlement because the French, the French um, colonists um, were more interested in trading, fur trading, so they needed native cooperation versus the, um, what became the American colonies where it was more about settling the land, creating communities, um, you know, working the land. Um, so I would, I think there, there are parallels that go earlier, but this is not what I'm working with. What I'm interested in is how um, 19th century discussions about forms of government kind of filtered into the literary language used to describe American um, national identity. So it doesn't really deal with that. <laughs> I'm sorry, if I know where Canadian literature... Uh, circulated where more people read them, or was, were they able to get out to the rural areas? There were subscriptions. Most of the literature published in colonial Canada was serialized in the literary periodicals. There were many literary periodicals, many of them short-lived. The longest and the most um, famous is the Literary Garland, and the library has a great collection of um, the Literary Garland for its... Um, um, eight years, I think, that it ran, so that was the longest. <laughs> um, and um, novels were serialized. Uh, authors published um, short pieces, of, um, short stories or fragments of novels in these uh, periodicals um, that included everything from comments on political affairs to ads for goods to literature. Um, so, and they were available, they were, there weren't many cities to begin with. <laughs> So it was pretty much all semi-rural area. Um, the, the, and, and what's interesting is that American periodicals were very affordable in Canada. So Canadian colonists would be as likely to read something published in the US as they were to read something published in, in the colonies. The fact that the American periodicals were so cheap and so available drew many Canadian literary magazines out of business because they couldn't compete. I think we have time for one more question, if there's any. Maybe just a follow-up to that. Uh, was um, the, you know, the novel popular in England? How it is it in England or in the United States? Mm -hmm. um, well, Wakusta, the, the prequel to the Canadian Brothers, was very popular in, in England when it came out in 1832. It was popular in Canada. The Canadian Brothers came out in Montreal. It was never published in England. Um, and it wasn't that popular uh, with Canadian audiences for some reason. And in 1852, actually, uh, Richardson launched an, an edition for the American market. Um, but if you look at the book, in the, the Canadian edition and the American edition, um, you see the difference because he had to get rid of all the passages that deal with Canadian loyalty to the crown. The description of the war was trimmed to the minimum, and so he foregrounded the romance, the uh, love affair between the Canadian brother and the American uh, woman. And most importantly, there's a chapter six, uh, which um, basically is a conversation between British and American officers at a dinner party, where, um, and, and Canadian officers, who discuss the use of the natives in the war. And it is in this chapter that Richardson kind of explains or just has the most articulated um, presentation of the natives as patriots, as of the American um, treatment of the natives, he was, the one fragment that I find ironic was that, well, if the entirety of, um, what was it, if the U.S. had to live with the, say, on the same amount of space as European countries, they could dispense themselves with half of the Union easily. They didn't, don't need more land. They, they are encroaching upon other countries' territory. That chapter, there's barely a few pages left of it in the American edition, so it was heavily expurgated. Um, so what resulted, <laughs> the romance of a Canadian and American on the background of a war was fairly popular in the US, but it was a different book. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.